to uh, teach me uh, to uh, uh, to uh, make me uh, 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 really really uh, a good pleasure to achieve this kind of surgery uh, using endoscopic. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for your invitation. Give thanks, Dr. Chili, for the amazing and the demonstrative presentation. And uh, uh, our next speaker is my dear professor, Dr. Mashudu Chifileo from South Africa. Uh, Prof. Chifileo is a professor of otorhinolaryngology in uh, Steve Biko Academic Hospital, University of Pretoria. Professor Chifileo led the first team in the world to use 3D printed forms for reconstructed middle ear implants. Prof. Chifileo presentation entitled Endoscopic Tympanoplasty and Osiculoplasty. Uh, my dear Professor Chifileo, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Welcome, and you have five minutes. Welcome uh, virtually in Egypt, my dear Professor. Dr. Chifileo? You can share Thank this. Thank you so much. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Can I share? It will going on. Yeah, I'm sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me, and um, thank you, uh, Prof. Um, Monia, for all your effort trying to get us involved in this um, endoscopic um, uh, meeting and uh, all the um, VIP or guest speakers. Doctor, please, can you full screen your presentation? I appreciate and I've learned a lot uh, the, whole, the whole afternoon. And Doctor, can you full screen your presentation, please? Full screen, screen your presentation. Okay. Yes. Is it full screen now? It's Still full screen. Now. Yeah, now it's full screen. Thank you, sir. Can you see it? Yes. Continue, sir. Can you see the full screen? Yes, we can see it, sir. I think you still trying to share all scans. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Okay, yeah, very well. Thank you. Uh, um, I come from the, you can see, thanks, yeah. I come from the University of Pretoria and this is my hospital. One of the best, the nice hospital in South Africa. Uh, you had my colleagues spoke about Cape Town. Uh, with Chris Barnard and uh, Pretoria, we, we have my student in the middle year. So it's always a competition. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, if you see all these talks, you can see they are all over. Uh, these are the people who tried to contact us at the university, and this was in the latest was in 2019. I, I like this quotation we say big yes again, do not need to make such big incisions. And I'm sure when we start to talk about endoscopic surgery, I'm sure we are graduating to be big surgeons. And uh, as it has been said by many uh, who presented earlier, to me, I think for us, we missed it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Now, yes, but uh, I think you will have to share the screen again. We, we don't see any. 
You don't see anything. Yeah, it's like it was cut and, and, and came back. Okay. Now? Yes. Yes. You can see the screen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was saying that for me, for us to do endoscopic, I think it's part of following what is happening uh, in the technological advancement. Uh, I literally do everything endoscopically now. Even my examination in my rooms, I don't use otoscope. I use endoscope for the nose, for the ear, for the lung. I'm sure we're catching up with what everybody is doing. And I love the writing by Moaz, who said that endoscopy gives us a better visualization of the disease and anatomy. And um, when we can see what we're trying to do, of course, we become uh, a better effective surgeon and uh, a better outcomes of what we're trying to do. But an endoscopy is an, it's just an instrument. And what you can see does not mean you can reach. That's why sometimes you need to have specific instrumentation which will enable you to reach the places. I started at uh, very being interested in endoscopy almost 12 years ago. And ever since I see the views with the endoscope, I use the microscope now and then, but I always appreciate what one can see with the endoscope and with all the advances. And I believe the companies are also influencing us because they come with the latest technology. And what you see from all those views uh, for you to be left behind, I always say it's up to you to decide. So it's more of a personality. And um, so with endoscope, we see a lot of things. And it's interesting that this thing, uh, it has been going on for many years, people trying to move following other specialization you gain into minimal surgery so that we can improve our patient outcome. And that's why now we sit here with um, trans canal endoscopic gear surgery. Of course, uh, the more you use the technique, the more you get better in what you're doing. How do I go forward now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm trying to go forward. Okay, yes. My internet is poor. I'm not getting poor connection, good connection. You can uh, stop, uh, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's okay now. Yes. So I use this personal uh, philosophy for myself that I have to be able to evaluate. So whatever instrumentation I have, I must be able to evaluate and I must expose, I must visualize, and then I must approach and I must do the procedure. Now we have exoscope, and sometimes we have to put the goggles in theater to see better. So for me, endoscopic uh, match is really the way to go. We don't have the choice, otherwise we are going to be left behind. So I think we are on the right track and I'm, I'm really appreciating for being invited to be a part of this good initiative. And uh, the different classification, uh, which uh, we all know, but it's either you can be a total or you can be a partial microscope and endoscope. For me, I don't think it's either or. Whichever instrumentation or whichever approach that gives you a better access to where you want to work, I think is applicable. If it's available, you must use it. So for me, I use both of them. There are times where I'll leave the, the endoscope 
and then work using microscope with both ends. And that time when I go back to endoscope. So for me, it's neither this or that. And uh, like you see the, the, the eye and ear institute in America, they try to come with their own uh, classification that you can be a non-tease or a tease based on what you are doing in, in theater. As I mentioned, now when we have the exoscope, most people complain that it's one-handed technique. So now with an exoscope, you can use both hands and have a better view with both hands. So we are being driven by technology. In no time, robotic is coming into autology and all uh, medical um, uh, procedures. So we just have to follow the trend. 90 and now in 2018 and beyond, there are more articles that are written on endoscopic ear surgery than, than ever before. So a lot of people are having interest. Most of people are having research, as it was also shown on your map, that interest is all over. And you can use the endoscopic for different things, as it was mentioned by pre previous presenters. Um, I also use it in most of the things. And um, um, of course, you have to start somewhere. As I was asked to talk about tympanoplasty, Oh, yeah. Sorry, we, 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 it was cut. Yeah. OK, let me come back. Yes, you can see now. Can you, see me, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sure it's Cape to Cairo, so it's very far uh, from where we are communicating. Yeah, but definition and everybody has spoken about the different techniques. And uh, I think, as I mentioned, it's more of, of preference. And the goals are of um, maringoplasty or tympanoplasty, of course, are the same. Just to make sure that you have an intact tympanic membrane and you also close the airborne gap, which everybody knows. And most of the time, um, I usually, uh, um, you can use any incision as was shown earlier. So I don't think I need to waste people's time with this because it was already presented by previous presenters. But I think um, the advantage, those people who, um, who don't want scars behind their ears and who want to go home early, I've done operation in, in a in some of the patients with small perforation. And when they wake up, they said, did you really operate me? Because they are used to big incision and big scars and also taking long for them to heal. So endoscopy give us that better um, outcome and the success between the endoscopy and microscope is always not very much different. I think it depends on the hands. This is some of the small video of uh, one of my patients. I hope you can see the video. 
Yes. Can you see the video? Yes. Of course, for a smaller um, perforation, easier. But I'm sure you can also do it even in the bigger perforations. So I use a trigger cartilage and I use a panetti set. And sometimes I use the, um, even the bio design. And I also use the tympanic um, uh, temporalis fascia. I try to do a sandwich technique, even if I'm doing transcanal. So it, it, it depends whatever works in your hands. And ever since I use this technique, uh, my take up has improved drastically. I don't usually stitch if my incision on the tragus because when you pack it nicely, patients don't complain and they don't have a problem of um, uh, reaction from your suture material. So I don't, I don't suture my tragus scar because I don't take at the tip, I just take in the middle of the conquer of the tragus and um, I just get the proper size and the patients don't usually have any complaint out of it. There are different techniques that has been um, well demonstrated in the literature, the only uh, butterfly. I also use it a lot and uh, it works. And uh, these are some of the results, which are, are very good and are well known. On ossiculoplasty, uh, the pop and the tops with endoscope, it makes a very big difference. And uh, I've been working on top and pop uh, since I, I did my PhD on autosclerosis, and I concentrated mainly on the processes. So um, I don't think I'll waste time much on this. I, all of us, we know why we do ossiculoplasty. Um, at the moment, I'm busy doing a, a clinical trial on the um, total ossicular processes where we're using a 3D te um, uh, technology. I've managed to Can you, you see? Yes. Yes, yeah. I'll say on the advances on the autosclerosis, on the um, ossiculoplasty, uh, I've just done a case on um, total ossicular prosthesis implant, uh, which we did in 2019, and we're busy with a clinical trial in the coming six months. And we're also working on the new stapes um, prosthesis and new stapes uh, technique uh, using the endoscopy. So I'm sure in the coming meeting, one will be able to present. I'm struggling to get my presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. From my side, it's not moving. No, it's not. Uh, yes, now it's moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the, the type of the processes that we're working on. We've done some cadaveric work and um, it worked very, very well. It's it almost like the normal uh, prosthesis, like the normal ossicles. And uh, this was the response from the three um, autologists and they find it very, is and comfortable to use without uh, with without any difficulty in packing or stabilizing it because it sits in the right place in the attic. 
We're just finalizing the article for publication just now. I'm sure you'll see it in the scientific journal very, very soon. And um, uh, this was the patient in uh, and this is how the new processes looks like for the total middle year, uh, which you call it a uh, three top implant. And this is a gentleman that we did, and, um, and I just saw him uh, two weeks ago, which is almost um, two years since the operation. You can tell that the operation was done on this side. I combined the external and um, endoscopic because he had uh, times two previous failed operations before. And uh, I think that's all. Thank you. Give thanks to uh, Chipleo for the nice presentation. Thank you. And we are hoping uh, the next time will be uh, a real encounter meeting, of course. The next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Nazik al Fudel from Sudan. Uh, professor al Fudel is an assistant professor of otorhinolaryngology in Khartoum University. Professor Fadil has a great experience in endoscopic ear surgery, and I was honored to meet her uh, for the first time in Cairo in 2019 in a panel discussion about microscopic and endoscopic ethology. And fortunately, we were on the same side. Professor Fadil's presentation uh, entitled History of Endoscopic Ear Surgery in Sudan Lessons We Learned from 300 Endoscopic Stiff Surgery. Professor Fadil, are you here? Professor Fadil? Professor? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's working, yes. Welcome, Egypt. Do you have a few minutes, Dr. Fadil? May you share the screen? Hello, everybody. It's my great. I can see you very well, Dr. Fadil, but uh, may you share the screen? Dr. Walida has the record. I, can I share it from my side? Dr. Fadil, you prefer the, the, our IT to share your video? Oh, you will it's be not she stopped. Uh, uh, yes, it's time. Just yes. minutes. Yeah. Just one minute. Yes. To try it. Welcome. Take your take your time. Take your time. Yes, it's going well. Yes. Doctor, please share the computer sound. You have to share your computer sound. Okay. Well, you may share the uh, presentation, recorded, being recorded, because I cannot share my uh, voice. I'm not able to share my voice. From the upper, the middle part, from more. Choose to share your your sound, your computer sound. If you prefer the third for deal, you can uh, you can share the coded presentation. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, okay. okay. Uh,
pleasure to present our experience, Sudanese experience in endoscopic ear surgery. And uh, we have another talk, uh, lessons we learned from 300 step surgery. I would like to uh, uh, thank the Egyptian Endoscopic Ear Surgery Society for this prestigious conference. And I'd like to remind you that all photos in the presentation uh, are from my beloved country, Sudan. So let us start. The history of endoscopic ear surgery in Sudan is uh, started at the year 2008 by performing the first endoscopic meringoplasty at Soba University Hospital. Ventilation tube insertion, it started to be done endoscopically in the year 2009. And by this day, almost all ventilation tube insertion is done endoscopically. First endoscopic stepidectomy was performed in the year 2011. And from the year 2012 onward, endoscopic assisted mastoidectomy is being performed frequently. The first endoscopic acicloplasty was performed in the year 2013. And then we started the whole procedure of endoscopic mastoidectomy. It is performed transcanal and it began in the year 2014. Then we come to the second part of my presentation, lessons we learned from 300 endoscopic step surgeries. Otosclerosis by definition is an abnormal formation of newborn in the middle ear that gradually immobilizes the foot plate of the stabis. And the disease usually affects both ears. Management of otosclerosis ranges between nothing or observation, hearing aids and stabis surgery. And this is dependent on the airborne gap, uh, the presence of sensory element, uh, that is to say a mixed hearing loss, patient's preference, and surgeon's experience. The concept of stabidotomy is performing a, a hole in the fixated foot plate for placement of the prosthesis. This is the endoscopic uh, stabidotomy procedure in quick. You can see the middle ear in our uh, operated cases, the age range from 18 years to 55 years with a mean age of 33 years. Males were around 40% and females were around uh, 59%. Regarding the duration of surgery, there was a learning curve and we think it's a, a steep curve. As you can see on the top right, the orange graph, this is the duration of surgery in minutes. It is calculated from the first year to the fifth year, and there was a significant decrease in the duration of surgery. Step surgery is a fine surgery and it has a learning curve. The duration of surgery as well as the intraoperative complications become less with uh, experience. We performed our step surgeries uh, mainly under local anesthesia. And the advantage of local anesthesia is that it allows for good communication with the patient intraoperatively, and it measures patient satisfaction intraoperatively. Another advantage of performing the procedure under local anesthesia with conscious uh, sedation is that if the prosthesis is a bit longer, you can anticipate this by the presence of vertigo. So this is a very important symptom uh, you should take care about while performing your surgery. The prosthesis in about 80% of cases was, uh, the length of the shaft was around 4.5 millimeters. In 20% uh, or less, we um, need to shorten the prosthesis. You can see the procedure being performed, section of stabidius tendon. In all of our cases, we used a uh, Teflon prosthesis, except for one case where we used a uh, titanium prosthesis. But in the remaining cases, all the cases, we used a Teflon prosthesis. At the bottom, you can see the graph. This is stabidotomy being performed after the removal of the supracrural structures. Stabidotomy. 
And you can see at the bottom, we have a graph of the uh, events in the perioperative period. In 92% of cases, it was uneventful. In 5.8%, patients developed mild vertigo and it was managed medically. 1.1% developed vertigo that was severe and associated with the vomiting. Uh, most of the cases were managed medically and one patient required a revision. Uh, we had 1.1% gusher. And uh, fortunately, the gusher patients, they were satisfied with regard to hearing improvement. And they were managed successfully. You can see the panoramic view using the endoscope of the middle ear. You can visualize the foot plate of the stabes, the stabidotomy, and the long, incus, uh, long process of incus beautifully. This is how the uh, prosthesis is being uh, inserted. And a very important trick is that don't be misled by the panoramic view, and uh, especially when you are using 30 degree endoscope. And you have to remove the scutum because you want to see and you want to instrument as well. We place a piece of uh, lobule fat at the stabidotomy site after insertion of the prosthesis. And in uh, nearly half of cases, we utilized vein graft where we place the vein graft after stabidotomy and before insertion of the prosthesis. The fat as well as the vein graft are very important to guard against perilymph fistula. This is a summary of the steps, tympanometer flap elevation, scutum removal, section of stapedius tendon, separation of incudus stapedial joint, fracture of supracrural structures, stabidotomy and prosthesis insertion. We will talk about preservation of the corda tympani and notes on revision surgery. Elevation of tympanometer flap. This is a very important step and it should be done perfectly at the beginning of your surgery so that you are not nervous during the procedure. Tear could occur, and it happened in our cases in 5.8% of patients in the first year, and we had 1.2% of cases with shortened flap that was augmented. How to avoid tear in your tympanometer flap? Number one, you have to take good time with adequate infiltration of the posterior canal wall skin using the diluted adrenaline. This is hydrodissection as well as, as, well as hemostatic. When you are elevating the tympanometer flap, you have to negotiate on bone and you can use different angles of round knives and start elevation of the annulus inferiorly from six o'clock to 12 o'clock and not vice versa. And avoid over removal of the posterior scutum as this can lead to shortened flap. Posterior scutum removal. Is it necessary to remove the posterior scutum? Uh, well, in nearly 50% of cases, we don't need to remove the uh, posterior scutum. But don't be misled by the panoramic view that is provided by the endoscope where you can uh, see all uh, parts of the middle ear. Because you don't want only to see, but you don't you want to an instrument and use an instrument. So I'm talking particularly about the uh, oval window. Uh, so if you... Uh, inadequately remove the scutum, this will delay your surgery because when you use the instrument, uh, we want to reach the target area, you would be unable by the hang or step of the posterior scutum and you have to go back and remove it. Over removal of the posterior scutum and by over removal, uh, we mean that your extent should not be more than the long process of incus. The body of the incus should not be exposed. If it happened, this is over removal. And if it happened at the end of your procedure, you can augment that part of the scutum with a piece of cartilage to guard against a shortened flap. And uh, this would be a potential for 
retraction pocket. The corda tympani. How to avoid injury to the corda tympani? In most of the cases, the corda tympani is hidden in the sulcus just behind the annulus. And this is the area where it can be traumatized. So when you are removing the posterior scutum or curating that area, you have to be very cautious. You can use a back biter, bone back biter, to guard against injury of the corda tympani. Or if you use a curate, use it in a parallel fashion to the annulus, not vertical to it. This is how to avoid injury of the corda tympani in its sulcus. Uh, in some of the cases, unfortunately, you might find the corda tympani at the center of your operating field. And in that uh, case, you have to push it either upwards, and this is a preferable side, or downwards. Minor stretching of the corda tympani is usually asymptomatic. But, this, but there is a consensus upon overstretching of the corda tympani where uh, you have to section it, or it's better to section it, because in an overstretched corda tympani, this gosia will take longer duration. And documentation, of course, of these findings in the operative sheet is very important, particularly in cases where the other ear is planned for stabilis surgery. Stabidotomy. Uh, the preferable site for stabidotomy uh, is the posterior half of the foot plate of the stabilis, followed by the middle portion, and the least is the anterior half. This is in relation to hearing improvement. Uh, if the patient, we don't have uh, or request CT scan routinely in our department, but we ask for CT scan high resolution of the temporal bone. If the patient is having atypical presentation of autosclerosis, an uh, example is the presence of dizziness. If the patient is having dizziness, we ask for high resolution CT and you anticipate the presence of gusher if the patient is having dizziness or vertigo. Uh, what do you do if you have gusher? We usually elevate the patient's head, wait for a while, and try to insert the prosthesis. And we can augment the stabidotomy site after insertion of the prosthesis with a piece of lobule fat or gel foam. Prosthesis insertion. Uh, in 76.4% uh, of cases, the prosthesis was inserted from the first trial, and attempts of insertion range from one to four. With experience, insertion is becoming uh, more easy. And this is the most difficult part of endoscopic stabidotomy, where you have only one hand. And in this particular step, the microscope is superior to the endoscope. One of the important points or the most important point in success of your surgery is the proper uh, selection of your prosthesis shaft length. And this is uh, done by proper uh, measurement of the distance between the under surface of the incus and foot plate of the stabis. Another important point is that multiple attempts of insertion can lead to hypermobility of the incus or subluxation of the incus. And if this happened, you will not complete your surgery because it's unwise to insert the prosthesis in a hypermobile or subluxated incus. In that case, condemn the surgery, replace your tympanometer flap, close the stabidotomy site with a piece of fat, and after six months, you can reoperate where the incus is more stable. Uh, revision surgery is required for two types of patients, patients presenting with conductive hearing loss after successful closure of the airborne gap, where you anticipate uh, misplacement or displacement of the prosthesis, and this is the commonest complication postoperatively, or patients with intractable dizziness where uh, in the postoperative, immediate postoperative period, where you uh, suspect fistula or a lung prosthesis. These two conditions require revision surgery.
Uh, important points are proper replacement of tympanum metal flap. If there is perforation or tear, you have to repair it immediately. You can use uh, tragal cartilage, perichondrium, um, temporal fascia, or lobule of fat. It's very important to seal the defect to guard against the possible uh, permanent tympanic membrane uh, perforation. Avoid insertion of uh, short processes because this will lead to um, improper uh, transmission of sound waves and there won't be adequate closure of the airborne gout. Avoid forced insertion because this can lead to subluxation or hypermobility of the incus. Follow your patients. And remember that a high frequency dip uh, with the presence of a dizziness or vertigo postoperatively is an indication of long processes. And then you have to revise your surgery. Documentation of surgical steps or procedure is very important so that you can make a self-auditing. And sharing experience in this fine surgery is very important. That should be also transparency in the outcome of this surgery. Thanks are extended to all team of endoscopic step surgery, Professor Hashim Yaji, Tariq Abdesalam, Dr. Azza Mohammed Al Hassan, and the engineer Mustafa Al Hajj for recording the operative videos. And special thanks are extended to Dr. Haider Abu Bak, who sent us the first step surgery patient. Thank you very much for listening. And deep thanks, Dr. Fadil, for the impressive presentation. And uh, next speaker. Our, my dear professor, Dr. Yazid Yazbin from Algeria. Prof. Yazbin is an uh, ex professor of otorhinolaryngology in Algiers University. Prof. Yazbin is experienced in endoscopic ear surgery 